I'm Doug Oster. I have a radio show every Sunday morning on KDKA at 7 a.m. My motto is, if I have to get up, you should have to get up too. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here for the class. Sorry we got started late. I'm going to uh, type something into the text here where you can feel free to ask questions here. Of course, I shot them off. And um, I just first wanted to show you this little uh, free daffodil thing that you can do. You're going to have to cross a river, though, maybe two rivers to get up north. but uh, this guy has got this huge property. Uh, it's going to be turned into a development. And so uh, he's got all these daffodils. And I mean, I've been telling people about this for a few days, but he still wants, more. He, there's thousands and thousands up there. So go ahead and write that down. I'll get this uh, ready to go here. And we will get our class going in just a sec. And we can always bring that back up. We can talk about that at the end. All right. So it's all about tomatoes today. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is called Heart of Italy. And there are hundreds and hundreds of varieties of, of tomatoes out there for you to try. And everybody has their favorites. And you really can't go wrong if you get a couple plants at your local nursery. When you're planting, though, compost is everything. Uh, compost is the building block for every garden, and it gives you the green thumb. Uh, you could make your own compost. You can buy compost by the bag. Your municipality might give it away. They make it out of our leaves up here in the north. They'll drop it. I'm in Ross, Ross Township, which is one north of the city. And as soon as they dump that compost, my informants call me right away and say, hey, the compost is here. And I'm running my truck up that hill as quick as I can get up there. And there's already up somebody up there with a Cadillac and five gallon buckets getting that compost because whenever you plant anything, if you add compost, you're going to give the plant everything it needs. When it has everything it needs, it's going to do a much better job at fighting off pests and diseases. And so if you did, if you were interested in making your own, all the people that, that do, and I'm sure there's people here in the group that make their own compost, all we're doing is we're taking stuff out of the kitchen everything but meat, dairy, and oils. Uh, and we're just putting it somewhere, you know, whether it's in three bins or a pile or whatever it is, taking stuff out of the garden, anything that once was living will become compost. It's just how long you want to wait. So you can just make a big pile. There's uh, uh, actually closed systems where you just have one bin and you harvest it from the bottom. There's lots of ways to do this, but however you get your compost, when you add it to your planting hole, you're, you're doing yourself quite a favor. And, you know, I was in this event called uh, Dancing with the Celebrities of Pittsburgh, <laughs> which was terrifying because I can't dance. But whenever they put the word celebrity next to my name, I'm, I'm going to be there. Uh, okay, let me let's sit in here. Hold on. Hold on one second. All right, Sydney, I'll let you in. <laughs> Okay, back to this. So I was in this event uh, called uh, Dancing with the Celebrities of Pittsburgh. And uh, it was terrifying. I was up against Rashad Mendenhall, who, who was with the Steelers. I always tell people he jumped over his opponent, his partner. I slid under mine. So anyway, I wanted to teach my instructor. And we worked together for six months so she could teach me to dance you can see it on youtube actually i took her to the nursery i wanted to help her garden teach her how to garden and she texted me afterwards saying i'm completely overwhelmed bulbs and tomatoes and how do i do this how do i plant like three things to have a green thumb improve the soil we've talked about it already adding compost every time you plant know when the plant goes in the ground hey this is tomato planting time we know that and don't let things dry out. That's important. You've got to keep watering if we don't get rain. Mulch is a big thing for tomatoes. We can't let that soil dry out. We need evenly moist soil. And so uh, when we get to the part of the, the presentation where I'm talking about growing in containers, we'll talk about the importance of getting that water to the plants and up into the tomatoes. And so the minute that I'm planting, I'm putting a nice layer of of straw on there. 
Well, let me tell you about my first. Uh, oh, hold on. Let me let somebody in here. Sorry about this, folks. Get them in here. Let me tell you the story about my first heirloom tomato. So I was growing this bean called uh, Cherokee Trail of Tears. I loved it. I sent it up to this seed company called uh, Johnny Selected Seeds. And I said, try this bean. See what you think. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And they sent me back a packet of this Prudence Purple. I've never grown an heirloom tomato. Heirlooms are varieties that have been in circulation for at least 50 years. And they were becoming really popular at this time. And we'll talk about them as we get going. Anyway, I adopt this dog. Her name's Pearl. And all she did was run away. <laughs> she'd run to the neighbors and hang out there. But whenever she saw me, she just would run away. Anyway, she was out. This Prudence Purple was just turning pink. And I saw Pearl, the dog, taking this tomato off the, the vine. And I chased the dog around for 20 minutes, which the neighbors were used to seeing. And got half my tomato back. And so I wrote a column about it. I was working in Ohio for this newspaper called The Vindicator in Youngstown. And uh, I wrote a column about chasing the dog. That was funny. And I was working inside the courtroom as a photographer in Ohio. You work inside and you get to know the judges and the bailiffs. And in a break in the trial, the judge just looks down at me and he says, you ate the rest of that tomato, didn't you? And I said, your honor, I'm in court. I have to tell the truth. Yeah, I ate the other half. And so that started my journey for heirlooms. And this is the tomato that made heirlooms so popular. In the 80s, when we were growing tomatoes, older gardeners would tell us, you don't even, you don't know what you're missing. Uh, because these old fashioned tomatoes were amazing. We're like, okay, if you say so. And they were all hybrids, thick skins. They all came in at the same time because all the money was coming from commercial breeding. And this brandy wine got into one of the catalogs. It's an old fashioned variety uh, that has thin skinned and very meaty and amazing flavor. And so this started this whole thing where uh, you've got your hybrids, which, you know, I grow lots of hybrids, but I grow lots of uh, heirlooms also. And so this is part of the process of looking at tomatoes that you might love. Mortgage lifter and like a lot of these perennials are these uh, heirlooms have great stories. So Mortgage Lifter was grown by, the full name is Radiator Charlie's Mortgage Lifter Tomato. And it's a uh, variety this guy was growing in the 1930s in West Virginia. He had a radiator shop at the bottom of a mountain, fill those old trucks up with water and get them across the mountain. But without any plant breeding experience, he crossed four of his favorite big tomatoes to come up with this one and sold it for a buck a piece in the 1940s, which was a lot of money back then and raised enough money to pay off the mortgage. So that's just, and it's a phenomenal tomato. You can see how meaty it is. Uh, some people like meaty tomatoes. Some people like juicy tomatoes. Cherokee purple is another really popular heirloom, really powerful tomato flavor. And with that, again, everyone is different with, you know, when you get a darker one, you get different nutrients. When you get a lighter one, you get different nutrients and different colors. Here's the one I give away. One of the two I give away, Limbaugh Legacy Potato Top. Mr. Limbaugh called me one day in the year 2000, said, I got the best tasting tomato you've ever had. And I was like, oh, I hear that all the time. Convinced me to come out to his house. He had these great plants. I planted them, tried it out, loved it. I was working at the Post Gazette at the time. And I put a little thing in the paper saying, if you'd like to grow this tomato out, just send me some seeds back at the end of the season and we'll keep it going. And Mr. Limbaugh passed away about seven years ago. This is the reason I wanted to perpetuate this tomato because when I tried it, it was phenomenal. One of the last ones you'll pick. That's why we're growing lots of different uh, tomatoes, but it's phenomenal. And at the end of this end of the program, I'll show you where I'm giving the plants away. I usually give the seeds away, but I also give the plants away. So people that can't grow from seed, they can try this tomato. Mr. Limbaugh, was a streetcar conductor. He would give anybody who had any interest in gardening a, a potato top tomato plant when they would get off the streetcar. He was, he was a great guy and didn't like tomatoes. He just grew them for us. Look at this thing. This is another cool one. This is one you could find from a place called Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. Ah, probably a little late for seeds now, uh, but I know that there's some greenhouses that sell this variety. Here's my heart of Italy. I love ox heart tomatoes. And sun gold is the thing that started me learning about 
something called succession planting. Sun gold is my wife's favorite tomato. It's this orange sweet cherry. And I was, I had blight really bad, you know, early in the season. I didn't know what to do. Uh, but these tomatoes were, were out there and I was going to be actually picking them on June 15th, which is early. And I started bragging about it. I shouldn't because we had a, a, a thunderstorm and a black cherry tree crushed those sun golds, three plants. And they're, they're important. They've got to be in the garden. But I had three left in the garden or in the greenhouse in six inch pots. And they looked awful and I never planted that late. It was June 15, but I stuck them in that warm ground and they just went nuts. They, they caught up, uh, which I was always taught, you got to put them in by May 20th at the latest to get tomatoes by September. But this one's 47 days from transplant. So by the end of the season, my tomatoes looked like this, except for those, they looked great. And so now what I'm doing for the succession planting is I'm leaving room. I'm planting early. I'm planting now. I'm planting my main crop on May 20th and 30th, but I'm leaving room and I'm planting later and later. And I'm, as I get later, I'm planting uh, earlier varieties and bigger varieties. The later we go into, uh, into the season. And so by doing that, like in the case of the sun gold, where it's going to be ready in 47 days, uh, it's just, I can put it in as late as 4th of July. And so I'm putting in a bunch of plants on 4th of July. And you're thinking, I know you're thinking, this is crazy. How could you, how could a tomato be ready that quick? Well, we're picking varieties that put on tomatoes quick. Sun gold, sun sugar, early girl, red racer. You can find them at all the stores. You, you look at the tag and it says 47, 50, 62 days. If it says 110 or 90, it's too late to plant. And so all those ones that I plant later from June 15 on, they never have the blight. Uh, but there's other things I'm doing. Uh, you know, I'm making sure that they're mulched. I'm making sure that, that they're, uh, I'm uh, taking the, the bottom leaves off so there's less space, be more room between the spores on the bottom that splash up to the top. And growing lots of different varieties. That's important early, mid, and late season because they all react differently to uh, the diseases. Now, when we're getting ready to plant, which is right now through, you know, all, for me, uh, tomato wise, all the way to, through July 4th, I'm looking for the right day to plant. It doesn't always work out this way. You might not always be able to wait for the right day, but I love to plant right before the rain comes. I love to plant on cloudy days. It's easier on the plants. If I can't get those two things, I wait till the end of the day. When the sun's going down, I plant and they get ready overnight and they're ready to hit the ground running. Every time I put a plant in, I'm watering when I put it in because I'm not waiting till I put a whole row in. It, they'll be happier if you just put water on them as you're doing it and then keep them watered until they get established. That's important. When you water, especially with tomatoes. You wanna to keep the water off the plants when possible. Yes, it's going to rain. It's going to rain at night, it does that, but we don't want to add insult to injury by watering these uh, that way, by watering the top of the plant. The top of the plant doesn't need cooled off. The water should be on in the morning so that if we do splash any on there, it dries off. Uh, that's one of the uh, things that tomatoes are known for. They're susceptible to fungal diseases. You get the foliage wet, you're gonna get fungal diseases. Uh, soak that plant in and so those roots go down deep. And so when it does get tough, that tomato can bring up what it needs. Here's a, a good trick for planting tomatoes I love to do, especially if you're a home gardener and you're growing from seed and you get some leggy plants, or if you have some super big plants, you can just strip off those bottom leaves. And I do this all the time. I, I'm doing this now, like I'm buying a few plants, stripping off the bottom leaves and sinking them into a pot so that that whole bottom will have new roots on it, that whole stem. And so you can dig a trench for that stem and put it down sideways and then fill that back up with compost. Now the roots are close to the warmth and they're close to the water that you're gonna put on them. 
just know where that root is so that when you're pounding in a stake or putting a cage on right away, you're not going to sever that stem. I've, I've had people do that before where they put it in and pound the stem, right? I'm sorry, it's the stake right through the stem. And, you know, we talked about compost. If you're adventuresome, maybe you have kids or grandkids, a worm bin is a great way to make compost. And this compost is 10 times more nutrient rich than what we make out in our gardens. And so worm bins are easy. It's just a Rubbermaid thing where you're putting worms in there. You're feeding them the compost. You've got some bedding in there. They can't get away. Uh, I have friends that have them in their office. No one even knows they're in the office. And when you plant those tomatoes, fertilize. This is a great one. Tomato tone, easy to find, inexpensive, probably eight bucks a bag. Organic and add this to your planting hole with your compost and it will help those tomatoes out. So let's talk about tomatoes and containers because this is a big issue. This is where we see a problem called blossom end rot, where the bottom of the tomato turns black. And we usually see it in plum tomatoes, container tomatoes, or tomatoes that haven't been watered correctly. Certain varieties are more susceptible to blossom end rot than others. And so I'm always recommending, if you're gonna grow tomatoes in containers, go with a big container, at least 15 gallons, and better off yet, self-watering containers. Uh, and, and I'll show you a cutaway. This is something called the earth box, easy to find. Two full-size tomatoes can be in here. Look at that picture. There's a shelf, and then there's some water underneath that shelf in a reservoir. As long as that reservoir stays filled, soil can't dry out. If the soil doesn't dry out, then you will not have blossom end rot. That blossom end rot is a calcium deficiency, but the calcium is there. The plant can't uptake it without water. And so whatever containers you're planting in, make sure they're watered or make sure in the, in the case of an earth box that you've got water in that reservoir, and then you'll never have blossom rot and you'll have good container tomatoes. They need water. They can't dry out. If you're handy, and this is what I do, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm not really handy, but I'm cheap. <laughs> and that's the mother of invention. <laughs> so you can just build one out of a Rubbermaid container. It's a shelf, a tube, uh, and, and some soil. There's nothing to it. And then for your containers, boy, I love this stuff. And the place that carries it closest to you guys in Peters is Chapin's Greenhouse. And no one's paying me to tell you this. Uh, this is a, made from a company called DRAM, D-R-A-M-M. -M. I buy it just like you buy it. I just, this is what I use. And all my containers are fed this dramatic, and it's made out of fish. When you apply it, it smells like low tide, but it is amazing at making your plants grow like crazy, called dramatic. And here's the, the, another way I'm doing it in grow bags. I'm using 15-gallon grow bags. You can find a 15-gallon grow bag for about $5 online. Uh, actually, I'll type it in here. There's uh, one I, I love called Root Pouch. And just look that up, Root Pouch and 15 gallons, and you'll find them for five bucks. And this, these things will last forever. I actually filled them with concrete to hold a carport in place. Uh, grow bags are nice because they're lightweight, they store flat, uh, and a black one like that's gonna absorb heat, which tomatoes love. Tomatoes and peppers love, heat, but they need their water too. And, you know, when you're thinking about this garden where you're going to be growing these tomatoes, they're going to need a pollinator. Tomatoes are self-pollinating, meaning both female and male parts are in the flower. But here's the thing, a bee has to get up to that flower and shake it with that buzzing so that those parts are combined. This is a plant called Mexican sunflower. I absolutely love Mexican sunflowers. You can find them at nurseries, hopefully down there at Chapin's. You can find seeds. You can plant seeds right now and get that plant growing and blooming in the summer. It needs nothing from the gardener. It grows six to 20 feet tall, it has orange blossoms about three inches around, and it'd be filled with bees and butterflies and hummingbirds. Mexican sunflower, it's a phenomenal plant. Okay, so let's talk about a pest you might see on your tomato, tomato hornworm. And so this hornworm has these rice-like cocoons on it. If you see that, you don't kill the hornworm. 
that's a parasitic wasp that's actually going to, I hope you had your dinner already, or maybe, maybe I hope you haven't had your, I don't know, but that's going to hatch those cocoons and the parasitic wasp is going to eat the uh, caterpillar away from the inside. We want to perpetuate that. This is an organic way of gardening where now all my hornworms, if they ever do show up, have this on them. I don't have to worry. They've stopped feeding when that's on them. And so the good bugs are taking care of the bad bugs. And here's a good trick at the end of the season. You know, I get a lot of questions on the radio show on Sunday mornings. When we get to the end of the season. When are my tomatoes going to ripen? Well, when you get to about mid-September, there's not enough time for the plants to make any more tomatoes, but they're going to continue to try with putting blossoms on. So just trimming off the tops of the tomato plant will force it to go into panic mode. And all those tomatoes that are on there, they're going to ripen up for you. All right, let's learn how to save seeds from our tomatoes. You will be so surprised at the quality of the seed that you will save from your own tomato. Your germination rate will be above 90% and you'll have more seeds than you'll know what to do with. First thing is, whoops. No, the first thing is you got to start with the right type of tomato. And I don't have the slide in here. <laughs> so there's two big families of uh, tomatoes our heirloom open pollinated varieties or hybrid varieties. Hybrids, the seed won't be the same thing. It'll always say hybrid on the tag or the you know, whatever's with the plant, the seeds. As long as it doesn't say hybrid on it, you can save the seeds and get the same thing. That's all I'm saying. So all we do with that tomato and all heirlooms are what we call open pollinated. You know, if you save from hybrids, you can get some weird stuff, but it just won't be the same. Most people like to grow the same thing over and over again and, and keep saving their seeds. So we cut that tomato open. We squeeze it into a little jar, which we've labeled because all tomato seeds look the same. So we know what it is. And then it sits in that uh, jar or the uh, glass for about two, three days, stirred once a day. And that causes the seeds to ferment. And that fermentation process, it, it cuts away that gelatinous coating on the seed that stops it from sprouting inside the tomato. And it also uh, kills some, some fungal diseases. And so once they've fermented, I like to put them out on a, to dry on a, a white, thick coffee filter because they don't stick to those. And then we can put them in a plastic bag and store them in an airtight jar. This is where I'm giving away that tomato. So again, you're going to have to cross a couple rivers to get up north on June 5th. But I'm not only giving away the Limbaugh Legacy Potato Top, it's also a plant swap where you can trade plants with each other and be there at 11 because it's nuts. But there's one other tomato I want to tell you about that I'm giving away. It's called 3945. It was found on the battlefields of World War II by a Pittsburgher who crossed this field of tomatoes and started eating the tomatoes, put a little bit of seed in his pocket and somehow got it all the way home to Pittsburgh and grew it for 70 years. And when I heard the story, I said, oh, man, that's a great tom tomato story. And we, this is another tomato we need to perpetuate. So if you do want to come to the plant swap and you do want the free tomato plant, I expect you to grow it out with instructions and send me some seeds back. And the funny thing about these projects is when I started these, the Limbaugh legacy with the newspaper, with the Post-Gazette, I had to ask all the bosses, hey, I, I want to put this thing in the paper where we're going to interact with the readers, believe it or not. <laughs> and they all said the same thing. You, you can give away your free seeds, but you'll never get anything back. You'll never see anything because all people want is something for free. And, you know, that was so wrong. And I knew it was going to be wrong because I know I know gardeners. And after all these years, since 2000, <laughs> the first year I got seriously 146,000 seeds back. And I get seeds back every day from all over the world uh, because I've been doing this since 2000. People have been uh, finding out about it through the Internet and it grows everywhere. And it's a great tomato. And so you can come get a free tomato plant. Okay, does anybody have any gardening questions? I would be happy to answer them. I hope you got everything you needed out about growing your tomatoes. If you had any 
general gardening questions or tomato gardening questions, you can do that in the chat. If not, I think we're done. I want to thank uh, Peter's Public Library, Peter's Township Public Library for bringing me in to do this. I'm glad you could come. I hope you're out there gardening. We've got a great, uh, uh, some great time coming up where, like I said, there's rain coming. So I'm going to be planting right before that rain hits. So Ed, Ed asks, uh, any suggestions for compost if we have not made our own? Yeah, Ed, there's lots of suggestions. Uh, it can either be bought in the, by a bag for like five, six dollars. You go to your local nursery, tell them what you're doing, what you're looking for. You're looking for good compost. You can find it that way. If you needed a lot more than that, if you were like starting a garden, I always tell people if they're going to start a garden, build up. And that means uh, get a truckload of compost and dump it and, and plant directly in that. Have instant garden. You'll have a success right off the bat. Now, you know, every nursery is going to have their own uh, their their own brand there just just good compost is all you need uh okay and to bounce off that this is sydney from the library i apologize for my tardiness um ed i know that the peters township uh, municipal government was giving away some free leaf compost that they had saved throughout the year that was available at the rec center um, or at one of the parking lots. So I would call the rec center to see if they still have um, that leaf compost, if you're interested in any of that. And that's the same type of stuff I'm getting up here at Ross. It's all from the same place and it's fine. You know, the, the thing that people worry about is, is importing something bad into their garden, but they have very strict regulations about the temperature that that compost is being made at. And as long as it's above 160 degrees, you're going to kill all the weed seeds, kill all the pathogens. That compost is great. Uh, so John, the, the main thing for, for preventing blight is succession planting. It means planting your main crop in May, but leaving room for other plants, uh, earlier plants, like planting an early girl from June 15 on to about July 4th planting later, you won't have the blight, but you've got to plant a tomato that's going to put one on fast enough to get them by September. Okay, let's see what Tina has to say. I love the discussion. Thank you. If you can't get the specific flower you mentioned for pollinators. Oh, yeah. Okay, great question, Tina. I just did a presentation before this one on pollinators. Yeah, if you can't find Mexican sunflower, actually the best way for pollinators is to grow a wide variety of plants, flowering plants. And if you go to the nursery and you just ask, hey, I want some pollen plants for pollinators, there'll be more there than you could possibly imagine. So Deb says, I get really small bugs in my tomatoes, small and black and pinpoint size. Any ideas what they are? Deb, is it a, is it a worm that's getting inside? Let me know in the, in the comments. It's, it's, it's like a... I wouldn't call it a worm. It's it's like a just a really teeny tiny black bug that moves. And it's inside the tomato? Inside the tomatoes, especially like at the where the tomato meets the stem. You know, I, I have never seen that in my tomatoes. Uh, so here's what we need to do. Whenever you see those bugs, and did you, I'm sorry, did you say they're getting inside the tomato? Yeah, they're at the inside. You cut it open and they're in there oh, and they're moving. Boy. Yeah, they're uh, great. It's probably the start of a, a tomato that tomato worm, tomato wire worm. That's all I can think that could get inside. And so basically what we want to do is we want to get to that, that bug before it gets inside the, the tomato. And so there's some organic controls. Uh, just keep an eye out on the tomato and see when this is starting and figure out which one of these organic controls is best. Uh, if you're seeing a, it's chewing its way in there. Then we use this stuff called uh, Captain Jack's dead bug brew. Uh, if it's a sucking insect, then we, we actually cover the insect with something called horticultural oil or insecticidal soap. Deb, if you go to my website, dougoster.com and just go to the contact button, I can look into this a little deeper and, and we can identify the bug and then I can give you an exact uh, way to deal with it. Uh, where can we call the check on the lead comp? Oh, leaf compost. Okay, Tina, sorry. Um, 
That was the Peters Township Rec Department. I put that in the chat. Um, if you call them, they should know if it's still in one of their parking lots. And Doug was saying something a few minutes ago about pollinators. We had your friend, Dr. Mark Miller, um, oh. <laughs> visiting us last week. He did a big pollinator uh, talk. So we have a link to that recording as well. Well, let's not get carried away with friend. Let's just, okay. let's just say acquaintance, okay? That guy of knows, course, of course. Knows his stuff. Yes, he he was a wonderful speaker and listening to you has also been amazing. Um, and I wanted to say thank you for the seeds that you, the World War II seeds that you also sent to us. Those got snatched up super quick. Oh, cool. Um, and we're also doing a seed saving program later this fall to encourage people oh, good, to, good, to bring good. seeds back to swap and donate back to our seed library. All right. More questions so we can get done in time here. Nancy Weaver or sorry, Nancy says, why do my tomatoes split on top? So Certain varieties are prone to splitting, but it's all about the, the rain. When we get one of those deluges of rain and the tomatoes are already on the plant, they can't accept all that water and then they split open. That one that my wife loves and that I love called Sun Gold, it splits like crazy, but I love the tomatoes so much that I, I put up with it. There's another one called Sun Sugar that's sweeter and doesn't split, but I like the taste of the Sun Gold better. And so that's what I'm... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting up with the splitting. Okay, yes, you can get the recording. All right, good, good, good. I think we're all set. Any other questions? Speak now or forever. Uh, let me put my email in there too. In case you have a garden question, that's what I do. I answer garden questions all day long. And I'm happy to do it. And uh, I was very happy to, to teach this class. We had a lot of fun, didn't we? I hope you had fun because I sure did. Thank you so much, Doug. And in my follow-up email to everyone, um, once I have the recording next week, I'll include your email, your website, Great. and then um, the June 5th Sorgals plant swap. Is there any information online about that? Yeah, that's on my website. Okay, perfect. I want to send that out to people as well. So if they want to make the trek up there to you, they'll have more information for it. Good. You should always cross a river when looking for plants. <laughs> <laughs> your, your closest nursery is always your best, but it's very important that every nursery has their own specialty. And I love driving around and seeing all the different stuff that's out there. So cross a river, come up, get some free stuff, and then spend a couple of shekels too. And if you have any other questions, send them along to me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you fun. so much, Doug.